Good morning, and thank you very much for joining us. I am Yori Folani. Hope you had a great weekend. Okay, about a fortnight ago or so, um, the um, Northwest governors, um, you know, said, said that no governors of the Northwest region of Nigeria uh, adopted, you know, a common approach in tackling insecurity. Uh, part of this came out of the launch of the Zamfara State our community protection guard in Guso, and so we'll talk about that. We'll focus a bit on northwestern, northwest of Nigeria insecurity. Talking here about uh, banditry, kidnapping, cattle rustling, uh, indeed outright terrorism. Okay, one of our guests today, uh, Larry Suraj, he's a security expert, anti-corruption crusader, and chairman of HEDA. Uh, he's joining us uh, remotely uh, from outside of the country. I don't know if I'm at liberty to say where you are outside of the country, but it's great that you could join us. Thank you very much, and good morning to you in our time here. I, I can say that we have a six-hour difference between where you are and where we are, so we doubly appreciate uh, the very early call that you are getting. Okay, you, you heard my introduction. Um, yep. We want to focus on that. Uh, banditry, kidnapping, cattle rustling, general insecurity, especially in the Northwest, and then the pledging of the uh, governors from that area to work together, uh, adopt a common strategy. Uh, and part of that was the uh, inauguration of the Zamfara State Community Protection Guard uh, in Guso. Um, uh, tell me, you know, this is the right direction, of course, but um, how much of a difference do you think this will make? Any little bit will definitely help, but Talking about this new formation, do you think it's going to help? Um, thank you very much for having me. And I, I think we, it is uh, already getting to the point where we need to actually uh, tell the truth to ourselves and stop allowing this amount of deceit uh, in terms of uh, this political pronouncement of uh, setting up this and then coming together on that, when we don't actually deal with the root causes uh, of some of these um, insecure situations that the country has already been subjected to, I, I think one of the key uh, points that would clearly tell if there's any form of seriousness on the part of the governor would be to actually understudy and understand where, um, why some of these situations are prevalent, and then also where you don't even have uh, a semblance of it. So my my, my uh, personal experience, and then also for any discerning mind, would be to look at uh, a state like like Kano, which is about the most populated in the northwestern region of the country, and it's not actually subjected to this militancy and kidnapping. And I, I would expect that uh, Kano would have been a case study for quite a number of other governors who would want to see. Uh, this level of insecurity brought to a, a stop in their in their state, uh, but where it is just just about a uh, whole uh, setting up of guards and then vanguards and um, bodies and the rest of that it is actually just uh, uh, begging the question. I mean, the level of insecurity would have to do uh, with actually how much we have compromised, you know, uh, the security system in terms of the police. And uh, the kidnapping that happened in Kaduna, Kaduna, for instance, is nothing short of even more secure, I would want to say, than Abuja, uh, the, city, the seat of, of government uh, in Nigeria. If you uh, look at uh, the amount of military formations uh, that you have in Kaduna, and with the last uh, kidnap, it, it is not something that you want to also just dismiss, and it is important for us to look at uh, Critically, how could that be possible? So you are talking about 287, uh, you know, uh, students uh, being kidnapped. 287 uh, will require some something uh, close to about, even if you're using motorcycle, about 144 motorcycle to move them. Uh, you will be requiring about uh, a full Boeing 737 aircraft to do that if you want to use it. If you're using shopper. It might be about 32 of them. And if you're using this, our 12 um, downfall buses that we all uh, know, that will require about 24 of them. That is not a movement that can actually uh, succeed without uh, either tracing, uh, either contact uh, by our security agencies and network. And 
where you have this first ring, two things are clear. The political elite are compromised, and then also the security system are also, uh, are also uh, indicted. So if the governors are just coming around, if we're not able to check with our banks, you can imagine the audacity of the amount of money that was uh, actually demanded as ransom to release these children. That, that is more than the budgets of several states put together, almost the national budget uh, at some point in, in time it is what was uh, uh, demanded as ransom by, uh, by the kidnappers. It's it telling us that um, we, we might be having a situation even where the chief executive officer of the state might also be kidnapped in, in, in times to come and the state would have to be paying uh, official ransom for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So for the National Assembly and others uh, uh, asking that people should not pay ransom, I mean, that, that might have some uh, sense gradually, uh, but that is not the situation because without paying ransom, what is the alternative? What is the way out? Our security agencies are not even capable of rescuing uh, victims of kidnap. So it, it is extremely difficult for us to actually understand if the uh, the governors and the chief executive officer, unfortunately, the governors have been getting away uh, with, with so many of these atrocities because people focus a lot on federal government and the failure uh, of the state government. When you look at the at the amount of allocations that goes to local government and state governments uh, without any substance, go to our state uh, primary schools, primary health center, uh, and you will see none semblance of governance at those places. The socioeconomic system has collapsed. And if you go there to the states where you have this militancy and the kidnapping, two things are always also clear. Is that there has been complete abject poverty and abandonment of, you know, the people by the government, or there's been history of ethnic uh, or religious, you know, conflict. And this, which are usually just a trace to our political elites and not just, uh, you know, national occurrences or accidents. Indeed. Uh, and further complicating this whole matter, I think a minister was saying uh, as recently as uh, uh, last month that, um, look, we can begin to look for part of the reason for the un unceasing violence and chaos in the Northwest uh, at the hands of um, uh, what he referred to as conflict entrepreneurs. There are those who uh, you know, deeply committed to this not ending uh, because it's a source, it's, it's just an enterprise to them. It's just, uh, talk to me about that, if you will, that area about, look, having said everything that we are saying is reasonable, it's, it's logical, there are secret conflict entrepreneurs in whose interest uh, is not, you know, a, normal, a, a return to a state of normalcy. These are, uh, so you have them both in public and also in private uh, life. So uh, first, uh, in the private life uh, would be our banks. Uh, and that is where you've also seen how much many of the banks in Nigeria are extremely culpable uh, in operating uh, several secret bank accounts. Uh, and at the same time, both for public officers. So, so many of the politicians, uh, high-ranking political officers, and even direct civil servants. Uh, directors and civil servants uh, are also having these so-called managers' accounts that are behind the radar of the financial intelligence agencies in Nigeria and also the law enforcement agencies. Unfortunately, uh, the government and the system have consistently failed to bring to account uh, our banks uh, for these atrocities. So every almost indicted uh, political office holder uh, of corruption have the banks that are complicit in many of their activities. The same thing, uh, and that is where the failure of the government clearly to actually deal with the situation is more uh, pronounced. The, the, the same way this is done for politicians and civil servants to hide, you know, their loot and at the same time allow for the free reign and operation of secret ac accounts is the same way that you have this for all those criminals that are also behind terrorism and militancy. And the failure of government to actually understand that by bringing to justice and also book, rather than using some of them as prosecution witness, is, almost, is also responsible for festering of insecurity in the country. That is number one. Number two, uh, many of our telecom service providers, so you can 
Also remember and understand when uh, MTN, for instance, was indicted uh, for failing to deactivate uh, um, uh, numbers that were not traced uh, to, they were not registered uh, by Nigerians or traced to NIN. So you can also confirm that quite a number of some of our uh, telecom service providers are selling SIM cards that are not registered on the network, making it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to trace users and also the numbers that are used by uh, these, uh, you know, uh, kidnappers uh, for collecting ransom and also conducting uh, their activities. Uh, so these are the key uh, entrepreneurs, uh, conflictpreneurs that we're talking about. Uh, you, then you also get to some of the chief executives uh, in the states. It, it allows for some of them to continue, you know, what they call the so-called security vote that is not subjected to any form of accountability uh, when they claim and pretend uh, to stem insecurity in their states. Uh, and it's, it's almost very unfortunate, uh, and it's getting to that point where uh, either the security vote is put to a stop or there's proper scrutiny uh, to what goes to security votes. Uh, it is as bad as, you know, local government chairmen also have security votes. I think councillors also have security votes. So everybody gets security votes, and there's no security that is also provided. Uh, in the system. There are politicians who also harm many of their so-called uh, supporters uh, for the purpose of uh, their political gangsterism. Uh, and at that point, when they either dismiss them uh, for whatever reason, or, well, or, the, or the, the political leader gets to either die or change camp, uh, those harmed you know, uh, uh, supporters still go away with their ammunition without any form of uh, control uh, to operate within the system. And the ones who, for political reasons, also want to cre create chaos within communities uh, for ethnic reasons, for justification of their political aspiration. It has never been in the interest of the communities, but just for personal interest, uh, for political aggrandizement and also settlement. Mm. Uh, also, first many of this uh, situation indeed and um well, that this, uh, that statement you know that i sort of paraphrased like I, I i actually have brought it up and it was actually the minister of defense minister of state for defense uh matawale uh who said this in an interview with nan news agency of nigeria banditry has its economy which is fueling crime in this country Conflict entrepreneurs do not want insecurity to finish in this country. Many people in the north are part of this business. So that's quite worrying. Um, you know, uh, and to quote him further, I call it a business now because those fueling drugs are part of it. Those fueling, uh, those selling food, fuel, other essentials are all part of it. The informants get a lot from doing this and they are paid handsomely for that crime. So it's, as you've been saying, and um, he's actually said, it's, 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 it's widespread. So now, at the bottom of all of the problems, first of all, in many places in the country, but particularly in the Northwest, has been this issue of um, poverty and uh, people resenting their poverty and wanting to get up and do something about it. And we have heard people say that, look, if you address the plight, the situation of the citizenry, um, we might begin to make headway in terms of tackling insecurity. Yeah, we've heard that, and I, I know you certainly have. You were nodding in agreement there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How, 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 how doable is this, given the, the extent of the problem? I mean, if, if the country could just shut down, take all resources, everything that we have, and face the Northwest and say it is because we want to remove the problem there, uh, that, that, yeah. that's, you know, that, that's not a doable situation. So are we therefore condemned to a continuation of this incessant banditry, kidnapping, cattle rustling? Hmm. No, I, 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 I'm not in, in actually uh, not in total. Well, I agree with... Uh, um, Mr. Watawali, who was the former governor of San Fara State. Yes. And uh, my real concern is how much of how these our politicians are able to sermonize uh, and then also speak to the country uh, as if, you know, as statements are made 
uh, with uh, that to people who suffer uh, uh, maybe in some form of amnesia. Uh, because we, we actually had a clear understanding and also uh, very recent uh, the history of uh, the performance of uh, Mr. Wasawali as the governor of San Farah State. I mean, that was one of the states under him where, you know, the whole form of militancy, a banditry, uh, became also more pronounced and put San Farah on, uh, on the map of, of uh, one of the most insecure states in the country. I mean, the, 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 the BBC documentary on on the complicity of also the state government while he was a state governor in that state uh, is also more uh or recent and is still there if you have if you google i mean he's always a friend to get some of those information but there's also the, the record on the time and the amount before he became also the minister of state or of the indictment by the efcc on the amount of billions of naira that was also looted under the government including vehicles that were moved out of government house when he was leaving office. I mean, these are the these are the real causes. It is not just those, um, you know, persons, informants, and all the rest of that. Those could only exist and fester in such a system where this ground is laid by governors who have deliberately and consciously failed the system, uh, refused to provide job for all these jobless. Uh, young people and others who would rather than get a decent job. How many jobs was created in San Fara under the, uh, the, the uh, Mr. Watawali as a former governor uh, to have engaged the uh, jobless and uh, unengaged uh, young people in the state? How much of opportunities were created uh, for businesses to thrive? So the, the, quite a number of them uh, creates this system uh, and this. Uh, this, this uh, network, and at the same time, the fatal ground uh, for the insecurity to fester. And they deliberately also look the other way, like I said, uh, because it provides them the opportunity to continue. Many of the governors that we talk about, they don't even live in the state. It, it was at some point that we always have local government chairmen. I mean, that is still also the, the experience and the situation. Uh, we would become uh, government, uh, get the chairman in the local government, and immediately they are elected. They relocate to the local government outside their act. I've really not seen that happening anywhere mm. in the world except mm. this country that mm. they relocate and live in other local government. Now, majority of the governors, particularly in the northwest, don't stay in their in their states. Uh, they, they stay in Abuja and they live in Abuja. And um, it is only just once in a while that they visit the states. So the, these are very serious critical situations that we, we must, uh, uh, not, like you said, we can shut down the country, but it is possible for us actually to focus very seriously on many of our governors. Any of the states where you have the level of insecurity uh, becoming not only uh, uh, intractable, I can assure you, and I think the system can always challenge uh, uh, some of us to that. The state governors are also almost nearly people. It, it doesn't take that long, you know, for you to uh, engage not only even the local uh, capacity and system, including the available international one, to track some of this uh, situation. But because it allows for the and, and where you're unable to do it, you can point, identify, and also locate people that are behind it. If, mm -hmm. if it goes beyond mm -hmm. capacity of the, mm -hmm. the failure to do that, mm -hmm. like I said, is still an indication of complicity uh, of the leader of the states. Indeed, and um, as it was worsening still uh, the the situation, complexity of the situation. Uh, food and hunger go together. Now, the World Bank has been has been predicting um, that severe food crisis is likely in seven northern states of Nigeria. So the World Bank has predicted that Katsina and six other states in the northwest and northeast regions will suffer severe food crisis due to high levels of insecurity and armed conflicts uh, in those regions. <laughs> this is simply by looking at data available and um, it's, it's going to happen uh, and we're all looking at it. That's why we're trying to focus on it. Quite frankly, what are the ways out? What, what what ways are there out of this situation? We all we didn't even need the World Bank, you know. Yeah, thank you, World Bank, with all your statistics to tell us that. But we didn't even need that to know that the way it's continuing. People are unable to go to the farms. 
banditry is coupling with this. It's becoming yeah. a hellhole uh, certain areas. You know, I, I don't know. Give me your thoughts on it. It, it, for instance, okay, let me just tell you, uh, uh, let me just give you one paragraph more from the World Bank report. The bank in its latest food security reported, uh, report highlighted Zamfara, Kaduna, Sokoto, Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe as the other six states that may battle the food crisis because of insecurity that has reduced the standards of living in the regions. This is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, so it, it, it's, it's very sad and very unfortunate. Uh, I think part of the reasons and the challenges uh, are the fact that our uh, political elites are almost us nearly uh, considering the situation that people who are hungry uh, can always be uh, at the, the easiest for them to manipulate and then also subject uh, to the level of, you know, the scrambling for uh, food opportunity and also becoming political tools in their hands. And this is not been about uh, just also looking uh, beyond uh, the immediate uh, uh, implications of, 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 of the insecurity, insecurity situation that we have. So where you have the banditry, how do you expect people to go to the farm? I mean, how do you want people to uh, actually produce even the ones that are doing uh, or engaging uh, in the immediate, you know, family uh, sustained, so, so system, subsistence farming. Uh, how do you, how do they afford to do that? This is the kind of living uh, uh, standard for majority of the people in, in those states. So even without uh, the World Bank, like you said, without being told, it is obvious that where these people cannot afford uh, to engage in the immediate, it, it's just almost like what you are having in the Niger Delta where you have the situation the people uh, are uh, traditional fishermen uh, and farmers and you experience high level of pollution uh, of the water and then also the farmland it is inevitable that you have situation uh, where uh, people will be subjected to uh, not only just hardship but also there's going to be famine and then also there's going to be hunger and so inevitably uh, the what, what has saved the situation with the Niger Delta is because there's been the investment of some of these uh, job opportunities, uh, no matter how minimal, uh, and then also the the amount of flow of the uh, federal allocation and resources that can still provide some measure of you know little trade that people get to engage. It's a complete different ball game when you look at the north, and I think we we need to appreciate where you can get uh, one or two uh, examples uh, without holding. Brief. You can still look at what is happening in Boronu State. So, despite the level of uh, the the invasion of uh, of Boko Haram, uh, you can see so a, a kind of a government that is struggling uh, to to bring things back to life uh, in in such a place. You can see also the situation that is also happening uh, in in Adamawa in Bauchi. I mean, looking at the northeast. Uh, 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 as a whole, uh, and you would appreciate what is that. But when you look at the, a, a state like um, Kaduna, for instance, and you're looking at the local government, uh, that is like Chikun local government area, uh, where those uh, children were kidnapped uh, from. I mean, this, one, this is actually a, a local government that uh, has accrued about 45 billion naira from federal allocation alone in the last eight years, they are about. And you can't point at, you know, any substance you know, development in that state. You, you can't see any semblance of governance in terms of uh, uh, education, health, and the rest of that. So, once this are failing within the system, it is inevitable that you are actually breeding criminals within those areas. And the earlier we get to see uh, the political leadership gets to see this, uh, the better. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, such almost like an unending situation. Yeah. Uh, of crisis that, that would um, not only just lead to uh, the farming that is actually being uh, projected, but also an increasing state of insecurity. And, and I think the, the, things, the, things, the situation is not abating. It is actually just um, exacerbating. It is. Um, okay, it's interesting that you, you know, in a commentary on the north, northern part of our country, and uh, in particular the Northwest, an extension to the Northeast, uh, you ended up commenting on the Kaduna situation uh, in spite of, um, you know, 
some substantial uh, monies that have been, you know, aimed at the problem over there. People are, some people are saying that we're, uh, we're, they're wondering if we have got our money's worth. Well, uh, we'll take a break now. So when we come back, uh, Senator Shehu Sani uh, is also our guest today. He's a human rights activist and a politician, apart from being an author and playwright. And um, he's from Kaduna State. And um, he probably will have a thing or two uh, to say also about the situation, but in particular the reference uh, you made to uh, Kaduna State. So stay with us, please, and uh, we'll be right back.